All right. Well, good morning again, and I am super excited as we found a new home, and uh, here we are, Hope Church NRV. We've changed our name from being the specific town in the New River Valley to being the whole thing, um, so we're, we're expecting everybody from all over the place to start coming, right? Well, it goes deeper than that. There's much more to it than that, um, but we are super excited to be able to be here, and thank you guys so much for coming uh, to worship with us, and I'm already uh, really, like, really looking forward to next week, um, so I don't know if that's a good thing when I'm getting ready to <laughs> preach a message that I'm already waiting for next week, but I am. Th- this is fun. This is awesome, and I'm just so glad to be here with each of you. Now, um, we are starting a brand new series uh, starting today for the next five weeks called Silent Killers, all right? So you see it right there. That is a fantastic name for a Bible series, isn't it? Silent Killers. You know, hey, listen, this is the month of October. The last message falls on Halloween. Can I not just have a little fun with our name too, right, that we're going to do? That's really what this is, though. Silent Killers is, is really the idea, as I'm going to get into, that, for example, you know, a diet that you would have, a poor diet would lead to cholesterol problems or might lead to um, some kind of high blood pressure problems. And the list could go on. You know, the foods that we eat, you don't think. And just a few moments ago, I had a really, uh, really good cinnamon roll, okay? Um, but you don't think that if, like, I did that diet, like, every day, you know, uh, every single meal, uh, that I had that cinnamon roll, what do you think is going to happen? Okay, well, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be much larger than I am. I'm probably going to have other problems in a couple of months and so forth. And you can kind of see it's silent. You know, it kind of reminds me, uh, how many of you guys actually got to go out and hunt yesterday? Anybody? Anybody go out? Okay, I know of, I know of one that went out. Uh, that would be me. And that would be my father-in-law went out as well. And um, we got this new stand, and we were so excited. All the pictures were pointing that all the activity was going to be at my stand. You know, and so I was, if we had laid down $100, but we as Christians don't, we don't do that, right? No, I'm just kidding. But if we had laid down money on it, you would have laid down money on the fact that I would have got a deer. But lo and behold, the deer came right to where his stand was and literally came right underneath. And he and I had these new walkie-talkies, the ones that you don't push buttons like because they don't have a thousand of them. They just got a couple, so you can't mess it up. Well, I don't know what happened, and I really don't think it was me, but his phone called, and it rang. And that buck looked right up at him, and he said gone <laughs> and, he, and he pulled the trigger and he killed him okay so I didn't get a deer but he did and that's just fun anytime you go in the woods you come back with a deer it's just a good day um, but check this out I just was thinking before he even pulled the trigger I was up there thinking to myself you know this is neat because deer don't just walk through the woods and look up all the time you know and here we are these like silent assassins sitting up in a tree with a bow and arrow that even when I pull you know when, when I release that that string and the arrow goes through the air. It's just, I mean, you can't hear a thing. You know, if I fire a gun, you don't even hear the sound of it hitting a deer. But if you fire an arrow through a bow and arrow, you actually hear the sound, the thump that it makes when it hits the deer. You're completely silent, okay? And I love it. I just wish that I got to shoot it. But anyway, um, that's the idea, okay? So it happens that way. And, you know, it, it, not just our diet. You can think in other ways, like, for example, your own home. If you have an older home, you might have had lead-based paint. Okay, well, if you have lead-based paint, that's a silent killer, uh, as it were. Um, mold. Mold can, can be a very horrible thing. And, and you don't even know it's there. It's not telling you, hey, I'm mold growing on all your stuff, but there's water. You know, you're just one day going to get sick, and then you're going to find out, oh, it was this silent killer called mold under my house or, you know, under this, whatever, wherever it is. And so there's bacteria, there's viruses, not like we don't know anything about that, right? Okay, COVID-19, we realize that, these, that COVID-19 is a silent killer. It doesn't walk around and float around and say, here I am, dodge your head so I don't come in. You know, it, it just, it finds you. And all of a sudden you realize I've contracted COVID-19, or whatever it is, any other kind of virus, strep throat, or anything like that. And so all these things are silent killers, but I want you to realize that in our spiritual life, there are these same kinds of things as well, okay? That's the idea that we're going through. We're going to be talking about these emotional and spiritual silent killers throughout this entire month. So we'll talk about guilt, we'll talk about lack of forgiveness, and what that'll do to you, and how to overcome that. We'll talk about commitment We'll talk about spiritual apathy, okay? But today, I want to really take some time and talk about pride. So that is spiritual killer number one 
is pride. All of these things take time. All of them take lots of whatever it is. And they are silent killers over lots of time. And pride is the very same way. If you think about pride, it goes all the way back to the beginning, right? Our first human story that we're aware of, Adam and Eve. You think about how they were able to know or be, have knowledge like God to understand good and evil, and that was Satan's temptation to them because if they could understand what God understands, then they could be like God. And it was that pride that motivated them to take whatever fruit it was that they took. In the same way, Satan, when he fell, wanted to be worshipped. We have record of that in Isaiah 14 and his five I wills where he wanted to be just like God and ascend to the mountain like God and to be worshipped just like him. And then really, you could almost go to almost any example through the Bible and find a, a, a person in almost anybody who has ever mentioned you can find something to do with pride. But one of those that I always think about is Nebuchadnezzar. I just, just can't get him off my mind because it's just it's right there. And it's in Daniel chapter 4 where he built this great kingdom. And in this great kingdom, and it says it multiple times in there, and he has this dream after he builds this amazing kingdom. And he, by the way, is the king of this entire kingdom. And he has this dream, and Daniel interprets the dream. He doesn't want to because he's afraid the king's going to get mad at him. And you don't realize this. It does say it in the text, but a whole year goes by. And then we come out to Daniel um, chapter 4, and it says in Daniel 4 all the way down to verse 29, and it says this, and we won't hover here, so I'm going to read a few verses here. But it says in 29, uh, at the end of 12 months, there it is, one year, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon after the dream, after everything had been said. And the king answered and he said, and he's looking out, is not this Babylon, which I, you see that right there, right? <laughs> which I have built by my power, he says. And he's built it by his power as a royal residence and for the glory of his majesty oh that's a heck of a statement and yet if we were to be honest we've made it just not in the same way we've done something and we've not adequately given God credit for whether the abilities that he's given us or the way in which we handled whatever okay and we've acted just like he did there and at that very moment he was almost turned into almost like an animal where he began eating grass. He lost his kingdom. Seven years went by until the end. When you read the end of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar gets it. And he understands that God's the one who gave this to him. And because of that, he was then restored and, and all that. And just a beautiful story. Okay, One of my favorite. I personally believe I'm going to see Nebuchadnezzar one day in heaven. I just do based on this. But you realize that pride was the deal. That was the issue. All right, Proverbs chapter 16, and it says, let's get over there, Proverbs 16, verse 18. It says this, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Exemplified in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and if we were honest, I could have each one of you write a novel and bring it back next Sunday and we could read it for everybody. Y'all want to do that? No, let's not do that, okay? We don't need to admit our problems. Let's just say this. We've all got pride, okay? It is a serious thing. And what I want to do is I want to take you to a passage in James because it's been something that's gone on throughout all of history. We've referenced Adam and Eve. We've referenced Satan, Nebuchadnezzar. That's really just the New Testament, Old Testament reference, as it were. But now here we are with James dealing with the people uh, of the early church. And you have these words. I'm just going to start in verse 1. And this is where we're going to hover. So if you've got your Bibles, you can look there. We're going to put the English Standard Version on the screen here. And it says this, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Okay, so let's walk through this. What causes quarrels and fights? All right, problems, difficulties, people arguing. People complaining, somebody getting offended, all these different things. What is causing that? The truth is this is all caused by pride, and we're going to kind of illustrate that, but it says this, what causes these things among you? Now you have to understand something. When you read this, and you read it as, a, as more of a book, okay, all the chapters of James, you're not just picking out this one little verse, you know, you look at it as a whole thing, and understand again, these chapter and verse uh, divisions weren't until just really a few hundred years ago. This is, this is fairly new stuff in regards to that, but it's everything you and I have ever known. So we would say, Go turn to James chapter 4, verse 1. Whereas even five, six, seven hundred years ago, they would say, go look at the book of James is toward the end. Okay? That's what they would say. 
And in other words, you would look more at a context there where this is so easy to pull out. But listen, in the context, he is writing to very clearly, nobody doubts this, nobody has any quarrels, although they have quarrels about many other things we're talking about in a second, no quarrels about this, that this is written to Christians. So we're talking about Christians, that there are passions and war within them, that there's fights among Christians. Y'all believe that? Christians fight? (laughs) I mean, really? Yeah, some of the worst fights I've ever seen has been within this church sphere, okay? And I'm not talking y'all particularly, although I'm certain if we went around the room again, we could find that without a problem. But listen, it happens. We get so mad at one another. Really, what do you think the rest of the world is doing as they look at us and they think, you guys, you can't even agree amongst yourselves. All you do is argue with one another, whether to practice you know, baptism on an infant or baptism by full submersion or whether it's going to be on eschatology of when the rapture is going to take place or, or how he's going to come back or have all those things already been fulfilled. And people go through and they talk about all these things and we get such fights about them. And then what we do is we divide as brethren over them. Do you remember a few moments we were singing ago and what is the one thing we all have in common? His name is Jesus. Aside from Jesus, we don't have to agree on all these other things. As a matter of fact, it's sometimes our disagreements or at least sometimes our differences that really make us who we are and how we're able to be the body as we go out and reach this world for Christ. Because you guys are going to reach different people than I can reach. And the person sitting next to you is going to have influence over someone else way different than the person that you're sitting next to. It, it's, it's just complete. Everybody, everybody has different influences and everybody is different. I just remember years ago, not too many years ago, I would teach specifically on the topic of eschatology. And I would teach it in such a way that if you didn't believe exactly like I said, it was possible that you wouldn't even go to heaven. Because how in the world could you go to heaven and not believe that? Whoa, 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 whoa. I just added something to the gospel, didn't I? Because the gospel is not, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved also believing in certain eschatological positions that Pastor J. Smith holds to. No, the Bible doesn't say that. And the Bible doesn't say that about you either. What I realize is that in, in terms of eschatology, people way back when, the Pharisees, the learned of the day, thought they knew it, and Jesus was in their presence and they got it wrong. Check that out, okay? So do you think that I, or even yourself, are going to know exactly what's going to happen? I'm just here to tell you, you're not. Good luck with that. I'll never stop trying. I'm going to continue studying. I'm going to continue looking. I think I'm right, because why would you believe something where you think you're wrong? But it doesn't matter. I shouldn't separate me from you because we might differ on a certain eschatological position or a certain practice of the way the church is run or anything like that. We shouldn't disagree on those things. But here James is dealing with people. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Among you Christians, you know what it is? Y'all puffing yourselves up. Okay, it, it, and it goes on. Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? Your passions are at war within you. Your, your pleasures, the things that make you happy, they're at war. I think about that phrase, at war with you, and I want to say this. It is a great thing to serve God. It's a fantastic thing. When you do something right, when you resist a temptation, when you lead somebody to Christ, when you work with the children, when you're serving coffee back in the back, when you're running the sound equipment, when you're up here praising Him with instruments, when you're singing down there, wherever it is, it is a great thing to serve God. It just is. But can I tell you something else that's really good? Something else that's really good, it actually feels really good, is to do the opposite of what God says. You say, Hold on a second. You, you, you're a pastor and you just said it's really good to do. No, no, no. I said it feels really good. All right? You don't sin because it feels bad. You sin because it feels good. You sin because you desire, you have a passion for whatever it is in your life, whatever it is that's warring amongst you, that's why you sin. This feels good. And then you do it and you feel dirty. And then you feel disgusting, okay? And it didn't feel good. It didn't last. And it didn't work the way we thought it was going to work. 
And so then ultimately, pleasing God is much better. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. But there's this war within us, is there not? Do y'all not face it every single day in different ways? Somebody says something that aggravates you, just rubs you the wrong way. You don't even know if it's factual. But they said it. And because they said it and you're in a bad mood, you didn't sleep, the dog was barking all night, your kids were up all night, whatever it is, you're just mad. And you know what's going to happen then? You're going to potentially sin because it's at war amongst you and it would be much easier to fulfill the flesh. Well, let me tell you something, you might say, right? And you, the list goes on of what you could do. But is this war that's going on, it's this passions, and that word passion is an interesting word. Hedonism, we get the, I believe we get that word from it. It's used only four times. Um, and there's other words for passion that could be used. But it's really this, this in, inward desire to please yourself. And it just seems to feel good. But we've got to, we've got to fight it. All right, verse 2. It says, you desire not and do not have, so you murder. You covet, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, there's some powerful words in through here, okay? You desire and don't have, so you murder. Okay, anybody murdered anybody? Don't raise your hand on that one. If you raised your hand on that one, couldn't get you to raise your hand on hunting. We, we've got issues here in this church, okay? Um, but listen, the idea is, even in your mind, Jesus says to think about something, you know, is to, as, as bad as have done the act yourself, okay? But it says here, you do not have, or you covet, no, I'm sorry, you desire and do not have, so then you murder. You covet, you can't obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. This is the reason is very easy here. It's all pride. I don't have this. So-and-so does. So-and-so is in a better spot with their boss than I am, so I don't like them, naturally. So-and-so is better than I am here, so I don't like them. You know, and it just goes on and on. It, that's nothing but pride. What else are you going to attribute it to? See, pride is the root of all sin. You say, well, isn't money the root? No, money is the root of all kinds of evil, okay? Um, but pride, I would argue, is the root of all sin. Anything that you do wrong has its fingers somehow in pride. And it's that pride that motivates you to do whatever it is. Here to murder, here to fight quarrel because you've coveted all these different things that's going on. And so with pride, I'll, I'll make a, a provocative statement that you've heard before, I'm sure. But life is not about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. You know, this church is not about Jay Smith's success. Because the moment it becomes about that, we're done. There's no point in it. What is this church about? All for the glory of God to reach people. To disciple people. To see people have a real and lasting relationship with Jesus Christ. Passionately following Him and making Him visible. Okay? It's not about elevating a person. It's not about elevating those that might sing up here or play an instrument up here. It's not about looking at somebody saying, that's the best teacher we've ever had. You know, hey, that's great. Let's give accolades where they're due and tell people they're doing a good job. You know, that's fine. But we don't need to have pride. Because it's going, what's going to come in there is the jealousy, the envy, the strife, the contentions, the fighting. The, everything else comes as a result about that. You and I are fairly insignificant. I mean, that's not really the message you wanted to hear today, is it? Right? You and I are fairly insignificant. Um, think about it. You ever looked up at the sky and looked at all the stars? I mean, just look how amazing that is. And you and I are sitting on one planet in a little solar system in the Milky Way. That's got a star that we call the sun because it's the closest one to us and provides for us and all those kind of things. But the thing is huge. And we're not even the biggest planet in our little galaxy, you know? And there's so many others everywhere else. You say, well, that's, yeah, that's kind of, that's big and that's massive, hard to understand. Okay, fine. You realize that China is like three times larger than the, than the United States of America or whatever it is. They're huge. They're probably way more than that, by the way. They're absolutely huge. The rest of the world is just massive, and we're like one little tiny speck on it. Just go take a little trip over to the moon and look back. You haven't gone all that far. You've gone far, but you haven't gone all that far. And when you look back, we're this big. <laughs> we're nothing. We're very insignificant. You say, okay, well, that, you know, that's kind of, all right. You walk by a graveyard, and you see a gravestone 
that's over 100 years old. Did you have that person's name and birth date and year memorized? Did you know that before you looked at it? You see, that's kind of a weird question. What I'm trying to point out, point out is the fact that a person who's been dead 100 years is likely not known by anybody alive. Likely not known whatever, whatever they did in their entire life is probably not even known. You and I are very insignificant in this whole thing. All right? But where we're not insignificant is when we share the gospel because that lasts not just a lifetime, but an eternity. And that's where we find our significance. And we'll talk about that later, even in this series as well. Um, you know, what, if I were to ask you this question, what's something that, uh, that you want right now? You know, I'm, I'm not going to go around the room, but if I said, what do you want right now? Some of you would say, well, it's getting close to lunch. Um, others of you would say, I, I kind of need a new car. And, and it doesn't even have to be new, it just has to work. That would be really good, you know. I need, I need a car that works. I need a better home. It's been a long time and we're just, we're constantly making repairs. Uh, I need some new clothes. Um, it, it's time. I, it, my kids, they just went and bought a bunch, two of my oldest two, yesterday because they didn't have anything for the fall and they're both growing, you know, and so we need a new clothes. What, what, is it that you, what is it that you want? What is it that you need? Uh, I'd love to get a telescope. Um, that's something that one of these days I'd love to get for my kids so we could look up at, the, at the, the sky. I'd love to have more money. Anybody else with me on that? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, we want more money. That would be really good. Because if we had more money, we could do this and we could do that and we could do this over here. You know what all that is? Something that you want. Something that sometimes even you might lust after or that you might desire even above God that you want to have it, you become covetous over it. You'd be willing, maybe not to physically murder, but if you could do it with the look in your eyes, you'd have done it, okay? And not been caught, you'd have done it. Fights might happen, and all these are a result of selfish pride. There's a verse well known, I'm going to take you to it, it's in uh, 1 John, and a couple verses there. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You see that very, uh, very close and very much um, about this whole phrase where it says in verse 4, you adulterous people, this is back in James, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You kind of see how that plays out. All right, These passions that you have, you know, being friend with the world, and if you wish to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And so this is going to kind of um, switch over. You're going to see that here in a, in a second where it breaks out, talks about Praying and asking, verse 3, you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly and spend it on your passions. You know, it's a little kind of breakout that James does there and talks about going and talking to God. You see, accolades, money, possessions, they're all what the world offers. But God is the true giver of every one of those things. God is also the giver of what matters, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, all those kinds of things. And so that takes us to verse 5 and 6. Do you not suppose, or do you suppose, it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I want to tell you right now that verse 5 is, is a difficult verse in, in, in interpretation. Okay, It a, becomes a very difficult, probably the most difficult ber- verse in the book of James. Uh, reason being is they look at it and they say, it says in verse 5, um, that the Scripture says, and then of course you see even in the ESV, it puts it in quotes right here, he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us. The King James will say differently, the NASB will say differently, and, and, and the questions about how it's supposed to be phrased. But the truth is there's nowhere in the Old Testament that anybody can find that that verse points to. And what a lot of scholars have come up with is that that actual statement that he makes is really just to get your heart set for what he says in 6, which nobody doubts, and is in fact, because he says, therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And you can find that verse in Proverbs 3.34, so James would have been right on that, okay? You can find that in 1 Peter 5.5. You can find that same concept repeated over there. But that first phrase becomes kind of difficult for people as they interpret it. The whole point, though, and, and it's understood with verse 6 is that God opposes the proud. 
we are supposed to have humility, which is the opposite of pride. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how humble are you? Because I'm here to tell you right now, I'm the most humble person in all the world. Y'all just didn't see the irony in that statement, right? Okay, that's called pride. That's what that is, all right? No, no, no. But we don't walk around saying, I'm super humble, okay? That just doesn't work. It kind of counter, it defeats itself at the moment that you say it. Uh, so it, it doesn't work when we do that. But humility is key, and we kind of see that as we go through. So I'm going I'm to go through fast this part. Verse 7 and following. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. All right, and I'm just, I'm just going to stop and talk about it briefly as we go there. Submit, the idea of come underneath the authority of, to listen to and obey. And I'm here to tell you that it's better that way. Those of you that have had kids and you've said, you need to listen to me when I say, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Little Gideon, poor guy, um, he's just like me. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll be leaving Walmart, for example. And Gideon is just high strung. His feet are moving. They don't ever seem to stop. And he's going to run straight out in the road if I let him. Okay? Now, I want to hold his hand because it's the only way to maintain that kid. You, pretty much, I just pick him up and let him spin the wheels as we just walk across. I mean, that's what you got to do to him, right? Because he just wants to go. But I've explained to him, and I've tried as hard as I can, Gideon, and he, what, he doesn't want to hold my hand. He'll look. Briley wouldn't look both ways. We've got her to look both ways now. Uh, but she would. Gideon will at least look, but he's, and then he just runs. He, you know, even if there's a car coming, he's just got to go. And so the thing is, I want him to hold my hand, but he doesn't want to hold my hand. If he holds my hand, well, that's a, that's a girl thing to do. You know, that's kind of the idea. You know, he's got to hold my hand. And so I'm literally almost restraining my kid while walking through the parking lot, gripping his hand super tight to get him through the parking lot. And I'm making this statement to him, honey, this is for your good. And, and then I, I'll explain. If you go any farther and you get run over, your head will pop like a watermelon, okay? And try to go a little bit more graphic if I can. And just explain the thing. This is not going to be good for you. There is no good way that this thing ends if you mess up. So can you just, please, son, submit to my, I won't even squeeze hard. I promise. Let's just walk together through the parking lot until you're old enough that you can do it and look both ways and do this yourself. You see what I'm saying? Now, I'm giving that illustration because it's like God is trying to walk us through the parking lot of life. And he's trying to say, well, hold on right there. No, no, you've got to hold my hand. Or he might be saying, stop, wait a second, look both ways. Whoa, whoa, be patient. <laughs> we don't like those words, right? He could be saying any one of these things, and we're like a little kid running through straight away. We might be lucky if we make it to our destination, but we're probably, we're certainly going to make him unhappy. And we could make other people unhappy along the way. And that's the best case scenario. All right? Humility is key. Submission means you come underneath that authority of, you listen to, obey. And the idea is it's better that way. It goes on to say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. That's a command. Okay? That's an imperative action. Resist. Do this. Okay? Resist the devil. Why is that? Because he's like a roaring lion, according to 1 Peter 5, 8. He's, he's prowling around seeking somebody to devour. He is trying to mess you up. And if he can mess you up, if he can put a stumbling block in your path, and he doesn't have to worry about you. You say, but I thought I was becoming a better Christian because I'm reading more and I'm praying more, and now I'm doing this at church, and now I'm attending here, doing whatever. I'm here to tell you that the more and more you become a Christian, it's likely the more and more attacks you're going to receive. Why is that? Why would we attack someone who's already failing? There's no point in that. We attack someone who is succeeding because we don't want them to succeed anymore. We don't. I was pretending there as if I was Satan. That's weird. But anyway, Satan is the one then who is doing that and trying to hold people back from doing what's good. He's a stumbling block. He's going to stop you as much as he can to stop you from doing the Word of God. And so we resist the devil. And it says he'll flee from you. You know, why is that? I want to make one thing clear. We're going to talk about uh, angels and demons a little more in week five, okay? It kind of fits also with Halloween. But anyhow, um, I want to make one thing clear. Satan can only be at one place at one time, just like you and me. That's it. We got this vision of him as if he can tempt you and me at the same time, even if we live in the same town. It doesn't work that way, all right? Now, he's got a bunch of little minions, as it were, maybe, and they're all doing, listen, whatever it takes, they're going to try as hard as they can. But they can only be one place at one time. When you resist them, they have better things that they can do then. 
and they're going to go off and try on the target that they can get. And that's, that's what we've got. That's the picture that we have anyway here. And so then it says, in essence, then, verse 8, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Draw near to Him. Come close to Him. The closer you get to God, the better off you're going to be. Align your heart with His. Cleanse yourself, it says. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify you, your hearts, you double-minded. Literally, He's not trying to be rude. He's just simply speaking the truth. Purify yourself. Cleanse yourself. Okay? Be wretched and mourn and weep. A very weird way of saying this, but basically this word, what's called a hapax legomena, a word used only once, really means the idea to repent. Okay? Be wretched and repent. Okay? Change your ways. Realize that this isn't working, that the path that you're going on. Humble yourself before God. That's verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. So as we humble ourselves, we see something. Verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. A bunch of words in there. Read it again and it makes sense, but I'm going to go on. It says there's only one lawgiver and a judge. He was able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge? Your neighbor. Listen, what we're going to find if we start getting rid of pride out of our lives, we're actually going to find that we don't get so angry when someone does that thing that they always do, you know, and it just grates our everlasting nerve. We're going to find that we can actually begin to love our neighbor, even if they disagree in major areas of life, as it were, to us. Things that really matter to us. We are supposed to love our neighbor. And as we do that, it really gives this picture, and it just flows perfectly with this idea of pride. Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about considering ourselves better than someone else, or considering them, that is, better than we consider ourselves. We're elevating someone else above ourselves. And so then when that happens, guess what? There's naturally less contention. There's naturally less quarrels and strife. And I want to read to you, because it's really just one of my favorite passages in regards to this topic, but Philippians 2, and I'm going to start in verse 5. And it talked about in earlier verses there about um, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit and, and consider others better than yourself. But verse 5 says this, Have this mind among, you, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We get the fact that the Creator died for the creation. Okay? That's why we're here. We're coming to worship Him. We understand that. But it says, therefore, God's highly exalted Him. He was hum humble, completely humiliated. I mean, I don't have to go through all of it. You guys realize how humiliated Jesus was if He was just a man. How humiliated must He have been having been the God-man? So much more. He's Creator. And yet He did these things. Therefore, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that's above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, of God the Father. So what we're supposed to do is to do what Jesus did and to humble ourselves beneath other people, to create and cause less quarrel. We're supposed to elevate Jesus because when He's in the proper place, we're then in the proper place. Uh, when we elevate ourselves, we're elevated above God. When we elevate Him, He comes in a place then above us. And so we'll be in the right place. And lo and behold, people will see what they need to see. You know, we talked about gravestones a little bit earlier as a way of illustration. And what are you going to remember if somebody, you know, just says, Joe so-and-so, you know, born in 1780 and died in, in 1845. I mean, what do you know about this guy? Well, frankly, he's been dead 150 plus years. We don't, we don't even know who he is. If we do, you might realize he's our great, 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 great grandfather, you know, of somebody that you know today, and that's all you know about this person. But you know what I'd like to know? Well, I'd like other people to know about me, and the only thing that I want them to know about me is the gospel. I don't even want them to know how many people we had in church on October 3rd, 2021. 
Or how many, you know, how great was this in, in his life? Or, you know, how many people did he lead to the Lord? I don't want any of that. I want people to look at a gravestone of me one day and to realize that guy was a Christian. And I know that he loved Jesus. Jesus came, died, and rose again. I want him to know the gospel as a result of knowing my name. You know how that's going to happen? Not likely by looking at a gravestone. That's going to happen by helping people before they get to one and before you and I end up in one. And so as we give the gospel, as we tell people about what Jesus has done, we realize that we put ourselves in the proper position not to be prideful, not to have as much pride and to rid ourselves of pride by elevating Jesus Christ because he should be first and foremost in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and the time that we've had to come and to worship you. And we just ask that you'd work now as we sing another song. And, and Lord, as we think about pride in our own lives, that you would, uh, you would just help us to be able to rid ourselves of any selfish pride. And Lord, to be able to elevate Jesus Christ because he should be first and foremost in all things. So we give you all the credit and all the glory. And we love you, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.